Okay. Now the reason I'm making this video is because uh, I want to make an unbiased video about this particular topic, which is a wrestling topic. It's the controversy uh, largely surrounding the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan, and especially the blackmailing incident of uh, SummerSlam in 1991. And, um, you know, I've been researching this a lot. I am a big wrestling fan, especially stuff from the 80s and 90s. And so I've got the DVDs for these guys, and I've watched them. I've watched all the documentaries. I've watched the newer documentaries on the WWE Network. I've read a bunch of articles on it. So I've done the research. And, you know, the reason I'm doing this is because a lot of people, you know, they post information, but it tends to be scattered or biased, and they only give one side of the argument or another, and then they flake in their own opinions and their own, uh, just what they think is really happening in their head, and, uh, you don't get the whole picture. So I want to try to put the whole picture out there. And, um, and this is what I've managed to cobble together, alright? Uh, now, first off, a lot of people, they tend to have a certain opinion about Vince McMahon, uh, and I'm not going to refute that large and by, because I do think he's self-serving, and I do think he lies, especially on his own productions, and the documentaries and whatnot. Um, and I've caught him doing it. You know, he says, uh, anytime, you know, you're watching a documentary about the Monday Night Wars, or ECW, or WCW, and they talk about how um, WCW pretty much raided the talent from ECW, which you can't deny, a lot of uh, the top ECW guys did move to WCW in droves. So you can't just say, oh, that didn't happen. It, it did. You can see it. Uh, but every time they talk about this, you know, they'll have Vince chime in and say, oh, I don't do that. I'm, I'm above that. You know, that's too uh, immoral or unethical. But it's not true. He did it with AWA. He stole a whole bunch. He kept stealing their top guys year after year because uh, Vern Gagne refused to sell to him, to sell the company. And, um, and he did this. He paid people to specifically no-show at cards. And he did this with Hulk Hogan, and he did this with Gene Okerlund, and a bunch of other guys. Threw extra money at them to not finish their commitments to the company. And he did that. So, and to this day, when he makes, even though he made that documentary, and um, it, it's pointed out that he did that. Uh, but he still denies that he ever did that. For, with any company, when they do one of these new documentaries, like the Monday Night War miniseries on WWE Network where he says he never did that. But years ago, he released the AWA documentary where it specifically says he did that. So I know he's not a saint. I know he lies and he's self-serving. But to suggest, a lot of people are suggesting with all these documentaries, that especially with WCW-related ones uh, and the original Ultimate Warrior DVD, that Vince is paying people off to propagate his opinions and his views and that is just paranoia you know to suggest that these guys are just reading from a script all the time um, looking at Ultimate Warrior specifically the only person who changed their story from the first DVD was Triple H and because he said he didn't like working with the Warrior at WrestleMania 12 and he was extremely unprofessional and of course in the new sets Triple H is there and he's getting along great with the Warrior and he says he's a good guy and everything uh, he's changed his story, but it could be just that he changed his opinion because he didn't know the guy real well at WrestleMania 12 and when the first DVD set was made he probably still hadn't really met Jim Helwig, you know, the, the man as opposed to the Ultimate Warrior character. Um, but he's the only one. I mean, everyone else who said something critical really just didn't get featured in the new one. The big one would probably be Bobby Heenan. To say that Bobby Heenan was paid to read a script and make up stories that just sounds stupid, you know. Um, like I said, in other documentaries, they pointed out things that Vince has done wrong, like the AWA documentary, uh, and even some of the other stuff, like the WCCW documentaries, and, you know, these other things, where people have had issues with Vince, and they've vented it in these DVDs. So to suggest that he's editing it, obviously he's not, because it's there. Um, if anything, they're going to keep it there, because the controversy, the conflicting reports is going to get you better ratings, you know? Um, so it's, it's, I don't think that they paid off Bobby Heenan to make up stories. I think those stories are, I think Bobby Heenan did not like the Ultimate Warrior. I think there's a lot of guys that did not like the Ultimate Warrior, um, or Jim Helwig as a person. Um, so, you know, I just, I wanted to start with that because people, 
people are paranoid. And I'm not buying into the paranoia until I can see definitive proof of it. And I've seen proof of the contrary, if anything, so far. Alright? So, and the thing with the Ultimate Warrior, a lot of the, the negative comments that were made about him, the criticisms, they're not really opinions, you know? They're not, they don't, they're not made up. Like, you can't make up that the guy didn't use a lot of moves, because he didn't. You know, he, he had his, his shoulder block, his gorilla press, and then his, his splash. And that was pretty much the bulk of his matches. Uh, even his matches with Hogan, you know, it was, it was all presentation. There wasn't a lot of stuff, and there's no denying that. And are you going to say that they're, they're paid to say that when he's, he's never done that? Like, really, underneath, he was a scientific wrestler. He was all arm drags and, and death locks and submission holds. And, you know, he only presented himself in a limited respect? No, of course not. Obviously, he didn't have a high repertoire of skill, of actual physical talent for pulling off a scientific match. Um, so you can't debate that. That's there. You can't debate the, the promos not making sense. They didn't. They were out of this freaking world. And even he admits it now. Nobody could understand it. So is that, you know, a made-up criticism, something Vince McMahon was paid people to do when you're watching the footage of him going nuts and not making any sense? How the hell is that paid fucking criticism? It's not. So there's obviously faults to the character, to the person right off the bat. And, you know, he's only human. He makes mistakes. He doesn't always get it 100% right. That's just part of the gig. Um, and that's fine. Uh, well, you get into this controversial stuff, you kind of start seeing what he was really like and what the real problems were on both sides of things. Um, and I'm still a fan of the guy. I still like watching the matches, even though they're short and they don't show much. I'm not one of those guys who says it has to be a scientific match or it's not a real wrestling match. It isn't worth watching. Um, I do enjoy the spectacle. I do enjoy the promos as wild as they are. But the controversy is where things get hung up, especially with me. I'm not going to refute the guy's uh, Hall of Fame position. I'm not going to say he deserved to die or anything insane like that. But I am going to say that I'm not sure what I think of him as a person, you know. As uh, a wrestler, as a character, yeah, he was great. But, um... Sorry, I'm keeping the TV on. Um... There, there's questionable things like that the blackmailing incident is it's generally referred to where basically in the original DVD Vince says that uh, Warrior came to him and said you have to pay me five hundred thousand dollars and I'm not going to show up for SummerSlam this year this was 1991 and um, now it's in the Ultimate Warrior in the newer DVDs they don't address this really they kind of glaze over it uh, apparently, as part of the arrangement with the release of the new DVDs and the, them working out, uh, repairing the relationship, was that they would release his original letter, and uh, which was dated and everything. And so we, it's pretty much all come to light now. Um, what Warrior did, Jim Helwig, after WrestleMania 7, sent a letter to Vince McMahon saying that he wanted to get paid $550,000 for WrestleMania 7, the retirement match with Macho Man Randy Savage, that he also wanted to get royalties for his merchandise, for ticket sales, for his hotline, uh, all of which had to rival the rates Hogan was getting, Hulk Hogan, for all of that stuff. And uh, you know, it was a very lengthy, wordy document uh, talking about how he felt he was treated unfairly, how he felt he had paid his dues, that he was the biggest draw on the company, and so on and so forth. Um, and at the end, and this is where it gets specific, because this is where people deviate. At the end of the letter, he says, until I get a response, I will be at home with someone who cares. He's telling Vince right there, I'm not coming in until you pay me this money, and you amend my contract to give me more money for everything else from now on. And, another thing I forgot, one of the stipulations was extra time off. Uh, it was worded like four days every period, every pay period or something, which is, it sounds like a normal two days off, like a weekend kind of deal. Uh, you know, and as far as the time off thing goes, I 
can kind of understand people you know they always empathize well he wants to spend time with his family so who's you know would deny him time with his family but the thing is that's part of being a pro wrestler you know when he sat down and decided that this was going to be his career and he didn't do it because he was a fan he didn't do it because uh, his friends were in it or something he did it because he saw money there it was always always about the money with him so he wasn't a career guy to begin with and he's you have to understand when you become a wrestler you are on the road all year long you know 365 days especially if you work for Vince you're gonna have to do house shows you're gonna have to do special appearances you're gonna be all over the place from day to day to day to day you are gonna be constantly on the road working that's the way Vince runs his company and that's why most rest all wrestling companies were like that before before Vince came along that's just how it was done every single day you wrestled and you didn't make a lot of money especially in the beginning it took a long time a lot of years to pay your dues and really get up there uh, the, and Warrior, Jim Helwig got the shortcut from the beginning because of his physique, because he was a bodybuilder and he had the look and the intensity and the presentation. He got a buy through the paying dues. He, he did. You can't fucking deny. The guy had only been working with the World Wrestling Federation at that point for three years. Three years, starting in 88, 88, 89, 90, okay, four years, 91. But that's it. He hadn't been around that long. Hogan had been wrestling with the WWE since 79, I think. Somewhere, it was in the 70s. Because he was there when Bruno San Martino, well, not Bruno, but uh, Bruno's replacement, Bob Backlund, was running the plate and was the head guy. And he was feuding with uh, Andre the Giant back when Andre was still one of the regular roster guys. You know, so he had, he had been there over 10 years of experience wrestling there and in other territories before the warrior came along so Jim Helwig was the new guy who got pushed right up to the top because of that it factor and pushed right into the main event so he he didn't pay his dues he didn't and he didn't understand that part of being a wrestler means you're not gonna spend time with your family that's just what it is that's your decision when you sign up for the job that's what you sign up for and it sucks but it's true and all the wrestlers, every professional wrestler ever has had to go through that. You know, that is one of your sacrifices. So if you want to start a family, you want to be a family man, you don't become a pro wrestler. You know, that's just something you have to accept and understand. And that's not an excuse to get more money, to get more time off. If you can't handle the workload, then you can't do the job. And that's that. You know, that is all there is to it. Um, that, that's my conflicts with the remarks he made about those. But also, he did hold up Vince. It was he sent this letter weeks before SummerSlam, so it's not like he put the gun to his head that night or the day before or something. But he did say specifically, "I'm not showing up unless you pay me this five hundred and fifty thousand dollars." And that's holding him up. That's blackmail. That's saying you've got me booked. Uh, the ticket sales have already been done. People are expecting me to show up for this event, and I'm not going to show up if you don't pay me. That's what he did. He didn't do it as late as the first DVD set, set says, but he did do it. And Vince obliged him at the time. He put in a new contract. His reply letter said he was going to write a new contract that was going to make sure that Warrior was paid more than absolutely everybody else in the company. And he was polite about it all the way through to the end and suspended the guy after SummerSlam. And honestly, in retrospect, I can't blame him because... Like I said, Warrior didn't pay his dues. Warrior didn't have skill. He didn't have talent. He was he had a great pr presentation, but he wasn't he wasn't the a real main event guy. And the reason for that is even he put the asses in the seats, but the thing is the guy who's the head of the company has to be able to put other people over. You know, uh, that's what makes the matches work. Hogan was a little tricky. He had trouble with it too. He did. I like Hogan. He's one of my favorites. But Hogan also had a limited moveset. It was a little better than Warriors, but not much. And uh, he couldn't have good matches with everybody. You know, it only worked with certain people. Uh, well, it worked better with certain people, really, is how I should phrase it. Um, but uh, Warrior couldn't do that. Warrior couldn't have a good match with everybody. His matches had to be a few seconds long. If it was any longer, he could only pull it off with specific individuals, Hulk Hogan being one of them. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, everyone had a good match for Randy Savage, it didn't matter who you were. Uh, you know, 
Honky Tonk Man, Rick Rude especially, he had good matches with. But a lot of guys he didn't have good matches with, you know? Um, and you need that to be the guy heading the company. You can't just be in it for yourself. You have to be able to work with people. You have to be able to promote them as much as you're promoting yourself. The idea is to put on a good show. Warrior didn't care about the show. He didn't care about the other guys, the other talents. He didn't care about the lasting impact on the industry. He wanted the money in his pocket, and then he wanted to go home and spend time with his family every single week. And that is unreasonable. And to say that you have to get that or you're not going to work at all. And Vince pretty much had to acquiesce because Warrior was booked for the pay-per-view. He was booked all the way through the rest of the months leading up to it. It was a big deal. He had to give the fans what he was promoting or was going to bite him in the ass. So he did. And then he got rid of him. He still gave Warrior other chances. You know, the thing about Vince is as bad as he can be, and I'm not denying that, he does recognize that he's a businessman. So he recognizes the potential money that can be made from um, reconciliation. And so he brought Warrior back. Warrior got suspended again for steroid abuse. Anyone going to try to refute that? Warrior doesn't. You know, Jim Helwig nobody said anything about it so it's yeah okay the guy it was using he was jacked up all the time so he probably was um, then they brought him back again in 96 like five years later and uh, they fired him again for not showing up to events and there's another little controversy around that uh, all of which comes from the first box set from Vince because uh, there's nothing in Jim Helwig's newer DVDs that mentions it I don't know if he's had any press releases otherwise. The original argument pretty much says it, uh, that according to Vince, Jim Helwig states that he needed that time off because his father passed away. Um, and no one's going to refute that, you know, someone in your family dies, you get time off, you know, for grieving and all that. Uh, but the thing that I always question when this kind of thing comes up, you know, he skipped some shows, but not others. He skipped the shows that weren't televised because his father died. But the televised shows he still showed up for. That doesn't click with me. Now, Vince takes a different uh, side with it. He says that uh, Warrior didn't care about his father. They never got along and all that. I wouldn't be... I wouldn't want to claim something like that without knowing. Uh, without having some evidence. Because that's a dick thing to say. It is. Uh, so I don't agree with him on that, but I do agree. I see inconsistencies, and when I see inconsistencies, it makes me ask questions. You know, uh, and I don't know how long a period of time it was. Was it one week? Was it a whole month of shows he was skipping? Because the usual, the usual break you get is a week, I believe, for loss of a loved one. If, when you work a normal job, you're 40 hours a week, you get one week of 40 hours for the funeral and whatever other arrangements you need to make and for grieving and then you go back to work was he doing this for several months for a whole month or was it just one week was it one show I don't know the specifics um, but either way you look at it he's skipping non-televised shows and showing up for televised ones that doesn't sound like he needs time off for grieving it sounds like he just doesn't want to go to the shows he's not going to make as much money on you know that's not going to help his exposure and he's using his father as an excuse, which to me seems like a real asshole thing to do. It does. It's anybody who's going to use their family just to get time off work always bugs the hell out of me, you know. Um, that's just one of my ticks. So if that's true, I can't blame them for letting him go. I can't blame them for not bringing him back. Uh, all in all, I can't blame Vince for suspending the guy so many times, for firing the guy, and his, for his motivations behind them. Because the bottom line was, as much as I like the Ultimate War, and I do like him, I like watching his matches, I like watching his promos, I, I acknowledge the contributions he made, but I also have to recognize that he was a guy who from the beginning didn't care about the sport, didn't care about the fans, didn't care about the guys he worked with. He was in it for the money. You know, and you can say the same about a lot of guys. Most guys, you can say the same about Hulk Hogan, who's one of my all-time favorites. He is. I'm a Hulkamaniac, but I also recognize he too is just in it for the money. So you know, I have to reconcile that. I can live with that. 
it's not a big deal to me. I don't think it means either of them are bad people per se, but I do think the sport has suffered over the years because of both of them, because of both of them drawing that line always over the money and um, just being greedy. Greed killed, well it didn't kill, but it had a negative impact because of these guys. Uh, you know, if Warrior and Hogan were in it for the sport, like guys like, I would even say Bret Hart and, um, you know, The Undertaker and even guys like Stone Cold, Steve Austin, The Rock, um, guys who were in it, Triple H, to put themselves over, to put other people over, to have great matches, you know, the, the Hulk Hogan Warrior feud could have lasted years. It could have been a, a whole era we would have had, uh, you know, but we missed out on that opportunity because... All they wanted was money. So, you know, they left to go get money or to do their own thing. Um, so that's the bottom line with the, the Ultimate Warrior um, controversy from back in the day. I still respect the guy as a performer. I respect him as um, his contributions, I acknowledge, as I said before. But, and I am a fan, but I can see that he's human. He has flaws. He isn't perfect. And as such, I think it's important to acknowledge those, you know, instead of saying, oh, no, he was perfect, Vince lied, that whole DVD was full of garbage, you know, Bobby Heenan was just making stuff up. Um, I think that's ludicrous. And the other, the other side is just as bad. People saying that, you know, the Ultimate Warrior was nothing but bad for the business. And, you know, he was good. He put asses in seats and sold tickets and he put on a good show even if he didn't have his, the scientific ability to do so, he still put on a good presentation, which says something. Um, so anyway, that's my take on the Ultimate Warrior and uh, his controversy. And uh, that's all there is to say for now. I might release more DVDs about more controversies. Uh, I have dug up some interesting information on uh, the Montreal screw job that happened years later, as well as um, I do want to do one or two about Goldberg later on and kind of the fall of WCW and the click and all that. I may make those, I may not. Depends on how time plays out. Uh, but I hope you found some interesting information in this video, found it useful for some reason. Either way, take it easy. See you next time.